Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. And yes, as you saw from the video description, I'm switching to AMD. And I'm doing that after more or less 20 years with Intel. Why, you're wondering? Well, this is for several reasons. And so let's see why in detail. So AMD's launch of the 3000 CPU line series uh, just a few months ago uh, set up the new era. So an era which was basically unthinkable just a few years ago. AMD has taken the process lead over Intel by fielding uh, providing 7 nanometers processors that contain smaller and more densely packed transistors than Intel's competing with the 14 nanometers uh, chips. Uh, as you probably remember, Intel with the last uh, in the last few years uh, had issues with the Ice Lake launch, which should be the seven nanometers once, and so, so they are sticking since several generations to the 14 nanometer production, trying to enhance it every time, but with the Sky Lake, uh, Coffee Lake, and so on, uh, basically still uh, 14 nanometers. So this is a huge step forward for AMD. Uh, the advantage obviously of increased density come in the form of higher performance, better power efficiency, more cores, more cache packed into the smaller area than uh, compared to the first gen Ryzen models, which makes uh, these third gen Ryzen processors uh, a potent adversary for Intel, not only on desktop, but also on enterprise, on data centers. Also another good point on AMD is uh, this continuous uh, strategy and policy of uh, uh, being uh, customer friendly let's say so with uh, also with the Ryzen 3000 processors uh, they are basically backward compatible with the motherboard solid available since the socket is still the AM4 this means that you can uh, uh, use an X470 motherboard for example as long as you update the BIOS also all these motherboards comes uh, come with a beefy uh, stock cooler uh, which is also RGB by the way and it's included uh, in the box uh, in the same price basically uh, which is something that we don't find on Intel counterpart like for example the uh, unlocked processors on Intel uh, like the 9900K uh, they come without any uh, cooler these AMD coolers also come with a pre-applied thermal compound which helps uh, transferring the heating from the CPU to the cooler also basically all uh, AMD lines, all AMD processors uh, come unlocked, so this uh, means they have a great potential for overclocking. AMD also added uh, auto overclocking for uh, the mainstream processors and if you add this to the lower uh, per core price uh, compared to the competition as well as the introduction of some uh, um, unique features like PCI Express 4, uh, you will start understanding why uh, there are so many uh, AMD um, units sold compared to Intel especially during the last few months. So let's talk about competition now. If we look for example at the 3900X this is a powerful beast of uh, 12 cores, 24 threads and there is basically no competition around in the mainstream. The first CPU we can look at in terms of uh, comparison is the Intel 9900K which is uh, only 16 threads so not really a competitor. The first real competitor will be the 9920X which is not really a mainstream processor but is more in the enthusiast platforms and is uh, obviously costing more, it's costing around double of the 3900X. Just in terms of comparison I purchased the uh, 3900X for uh, 450 bucks while the 9920X uh, would be around uh, from 800 to 1000 bucks. The only the real gain of the 9900K over uh, MD3000 uh, like the um, 3900X is basically the higher clock speeds since you can easily overclock a 9900K to 5 GHz or more. But we should also say that this gap is now reduced as AMD also did a great job on the IPC speeds and uh, since offers uh, PCI Express 4 which has doubled the bandwidth of the PCI Express 3 offered by 9900K uh, this gap 
app uh, should be even uh, shorter in the future. So talking about the dye, uh, as we can see by removing the heat spreader that we can see also in the uh, keynote from AMD, the 3900X comes with the AMD Zen 2 microarchitecture spread across two small 7 nanometer 8 core chiplet tied together uh, with the Infinity Fabric interconnection. They are interconnected via larger uh, 12 nanometer IO die called IOD. Since we have 12 cores in total and 24 threads, each small uh, 3900X compute chiplet comes uh, with 8 physical cores spread across two 4 core uh, core complexes, CC axis. Each CC X has 16 meg of shared L3 cache, totaling 32 megabytes of L3 cache per CCD and 64 megabytes of total cache for the entire chip. In order to create the 12 core 3900X, AMD simply disables two cores per CCD, which are enabled in the case of 3950X, which as we know has 16 cores and 32 threads. And uh, that's also the reason why they have basically the same uh, TDP. AMD also did a great job by improving the IPC by roughly 15%, uh, doubled the R3 uh, cache size, and doubled also the floating point performance by expanding the floating point bandwidth to uh, 256 bit in order to improve the performances with the AVX2 instructions. Talking about memory, there are also tangible uh, improvements on the memory compartment as well. In fact, Ryzen 3000 chips now support dual-channel DDR4-3200, which is a step up from the previous gen support DDR4-2966. This may seem a small difference, uh, but the Zen 2 microarchitecture, like its uh, predecessor, usually benefits from the increased memory performance, especially in gaming. Also, memory overclocking should be improved since AMD has decoupled the memory speed from the Infinity Fabric uh, uh, speed. So in the BIOS you can uh, act on those values independently. Let's now talk about another great feature, so the PCI Express 4 interface. As we already said, this uh, Ryzen 3000 uh, CPU line now supports uh, PCI Express 4 via the motherboard's X570 chipsets. AMD also added this new technology into its Navy Radeon 5000 series GPUs and has worked as well as with a lot of uh, storage vendors in order to assure a supply of speedy new PCI Express 4 SSDs. So PCI Express 4 basically provides uh, another great advantage, uh, advantage over Intel, in particular in the content creation area, uh, while in some other uh, areas like gaming, uh, so far there is not really a huge benefit, maybe later on. This feature anyway comes a little bit more pricey in terms of uh, motherboard purchase since uh, the X570 are well known to be a little bit more expensive than previous gens and this is mainly due to the uh, PC Express 4 interface. And we should also talk about power dissipation. So the X570 motherboards have twice the power dissipation of the X470 for example and this is also due to the uh, introduction of this new feature. For we should also mention that the X570 motherboards have twice the power dissipation of the X470 and this is also due to the new uh, PCI Express 4 interface. This is also why uh, you, you see the fan, uh, an active fan in almost all X570 motherboards. So still talking about the PCI Express 4, we said that uh, uh, Ryzen 3000 are also backwards compatible with the uh, other motherboards released so far on the M4 socket. But but in case you use uh, different motherboards than the X570, obviously you lose the PCI Express 4, which is, as said, not a big deal for now, unless you're using an a a PCI Express 4 SSD, uh, but on video cards there is really not much benefit for now. Okay, let's check the new box just arrived today. And here it is, a beautiful Ryzen 9 3900X, 12 core, 24 threads, 17 megs of cache, it's unlocked of course, and uh, should be also including a heat sink, but as you know I have a custom liquid cool system, 
So the base clock is 3.8 GHz, while the max boost uh, will be 4.6, but obviously we are gonna to overclock all its cores. So let's proceed with the unboxing. I'm gonna pair this with an Asus motherboard, especially the TUF X570 Gaming, where you can check the review right here. Now let's get rid of this seal. Here it is, my first AMD processor after 20 years of Intel. We have a small sticker. Installation instruction. Okay. And this is the heatsink. It's pretty big. Amazing that it's included in the price. While for the K processors of Intel, you don't get nothing. I would probably won't use this, but it's good that they include it in the package. Okay, now we just need to mount this big boy in the PC. And let's check how it performs. Okay, our case is now empty. Therefore, we're ready to install the 3900X on the Asus Stuff Gaming X570 Plus. You can check my review here in case you didn't see that. So, let's get into it. Okay, let's start with our CPU. And now our four banks of RAM. Also here, if you want to see the review of this RAM, you can check it here. So basically these are the same banks I've been using on my 8700K. So I hope they will won't run in any issues here. These are DDR4 3200 megahertz. Okay, let's get a nice click for all four of them. All right, they're fine. Now it's time for the M2 slots. So obviously this will be my main drive, but as you can see, there is no heatsink. I ordered one. I'm just waiting for that to arrive. The second slot already has an heatsink, so I will install that too. But this will be my secondary M2. Alright, we need the two screws now, one for this and one for the other one. So as you can see this is the Sabrent uh, one terabyte, really cool and cheap, you can check my review here if you're interested. Okay, now the heatsink. Okay, both the M2 drives are now installed. Okay, we are now ready for the installation of the Prism heatsink. So obviously I will be using a water block later on, but for now, just for posting reason, just to check that everything is fine, I will use this one and uh, just a backup uh, video cards. After that, I uh, will be mounting the wall liquid loop, which is a pain in the ass. <laughs> so obviously here there is a pre-installed um, thermal paste, so I won't be adding anything else. So you need to place this in order to have the AMD logo on top left, like so. Once it is hooked up on both sides, there is a small lever here that you just need to press 
in order to keep everything in place. Now let's plug our uh, CPU cooler pin. So CPU fan mounted as you can see. And now let's get this beast into my case. years later so we got our CPU installed our four dims installed temporary video card this is an Nvidia 730 then the two M.2 slots are always also installed I didn't plug any cable apart from the power and uh, obviously the CPU fan so let's see if we have a boot post now Okay, everything seems to be fine and we have our first boot post. Our CPU is running at 40 degrees, motherboard 25. So everything has been running pretty smooth in the last hour. As we can see we have a maximum temperature of uh, 70 degrees. But it's always around uh, 40 degrees i have no fans currently in the case so we only have the cpu fan all the cores are properly recognized so 12 cores 24 threads obviously all the settings on the bios are on default therefore the ram is not running at uh, 3200 as we can see here so the only issue I had is that the M2 the drives didn't boot I had to change a setting in the BIOS which is basically the CSM the compatibility support module once enabled uh, then everything is fine as you can see the Sabre and the boot uh, without any issues in Windows 10 Okay, now we'll uh, do some other tests, install some drivers and then uh, we will be ready for unmounting everything again in order to mount the liquid loop.
consumption of Earth has been reduced by 36.8%. There are two Hell Priests remaining. So these Ryzen 3 processors are really a powerful beast and uh, AMD was also able to fix uh, one of the so-called issues of the previous Ryzen Gen which is limited overclocking. In fact uh, there is a, basically a new auto overclock feature introduced by AMD with these CPUs. These new features basically give the users control over the maximum boost clocks by allowing you to add an extra 200 MHz to the maximum boost clock. Obviously it isn't guaranteed that the CPU uh, will reach those speeds at uh, every time. In fact the processor will still respect the limits given by the motherboard maker. The alternative uh, solution for uh, overclocking is the Precision Boost Overdrive, also known as PBO. MD says that the auto overclock is designed to improve performance in uh, single-threaded uh, workload 
modes like for example in gaming uh, while the PBO boosts heavily the threaded uh, application. In either case uh, you can toggle uh, both set settings uh, simultaneously for the best of both worlds but uh, honestly in my case I prefer the old way of overclocking so an overclock uh, uh, maximum overclock possible on all uh, cores and this is basically because uh, I find a little bit uh, useless to do benchmarks on overclocking uh, by testing games uh, since I'm playing 4k so uh, I'm basically the bottleneck is the GPU not the CPU but you will obviously find the benefit in single threaded applications if you use lower resolutions like uh, 1080p for example uh, since uh, I'm not playing anything lower than 4k since uh, three or four years uh, uh, I don't care about that and so I prefer to favor uh, uh, the maximum speed on all cores in order to benefit for multi-threaded operations. So there are several ways to overclock uh, the CPUs, uh, it basically depends on what, can, what are you doing with your PC. Uh, I will probably do a video on that uh, more in detail on overclocking uh, and will share my findings uh, based on my um, motherboard but more or less the uh, BIOS settings are more or less the same all over the X570 platforms. So please stay tuned for my next videos uh, if you are interested in uh, that I will share the overclocking settings uh, with you all and uh, please remember to subscribe and like this video if you like more content like this one and I'll see you in the next one. Come